FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. And welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. Well, we got something really special for you today. Insider's perspective on what is really going on in the White House and not just somebody who, who cleaned the floors there or, you know, guarded the place or menial jobs. We're talking about the former director of Oval Office Operations. That sounds important. Her name is Madeline Westerhout. And uh, Madeline, uh, you've written a book off the record. And, uh, and it's been received quite favorably by the president. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. The last thing that he endorsed was uh, hydroxychloroquine. And we see what happened there. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you for having me. Um, I'm happy to, uh, happy to be with you and really excited to talk about the book. And uh, I was very, very thankful for the president's support of the book. Uh, I think that was really fantastic. You know, we all know how he feels about books uh, written about him. And so to, to, to have that tweet of support was, was really meant a lot to me. I was very thankful for that. Okay, so we both, uh, I met the president many years ago before he was president a couple of times, hung out with him for a total of about three hours. I found him to be one of the funniest people that I ever met. He has a real sense of humor. Was that just me with a twisted sense of humor? Or what's your take on it? No, I think he's absolutely hilarious. Um, and that's something that was that I don't get into too much in the book because it's really hard to kind of describe in words his sense of humor. Um, but I think anyone who knows him really well would say the same thing. I mean, he has lived a very long and full life and he has a lot of stories to tell and he, he's a great storyteller as well, but he is definitely very funny. Uh, when we had some downtime, which was really almost never, uh, we would also, we would sit in the back dining room and, and he would tell stories and we would just be laughing and laughing. And uh, that was, that was a lot of fun to kind of get to see that side of him. Uh. It's just great to hear. So uh, I wrote a story about him because, like I said, I've known him and I followed his career from him taking over the Commodore Hotel, making it into the Grand Hyatt. It was a rotting uh, hotel, literally uh, its biggest, uh, well, I wouldn't even get into what was going on there, not appropriate. But in any event, I've watched him from his first public real estate deal through dozens of deals. And it seemed to me that the guy never stops working. He gets four or five hours of sleep per day. And then when I published this, people said, well, he's watching TV, Fox News all the time. But my point was that the stories that the press tell about what he might be doing, one or two stories, maybe three per day of his activities in the White House, I gotta believe it's a steady stream of never ending people, phone calls, video teleconferences, that the ordinary person would take them a week to do the amount of work that he does in a day. Yes, absolutely. He, he, he never stops. Um, and he has a lot of great people working for him, but he ran circles around all of us. Uh, he was constantly working and people often asked me, you know, what were your, what were your hours like? And my hours in the Oval Office were not you know, terrible, but my phone was always in my hand. I was always working, even when I was at home. And that's because the president was always working. He was taking calls at the crack of dawn and when well into the evening. Um, he has, uh, he returns everybody's phone calls. I think he's the most available and accessible president we've ever had. Uh, he has, his door is constantly open with just people coming in and out and taking meetings and um, even meetings that aren't on his schedule. He adds meetings himself, and yeah, he, he never stops working. Hey, so what was the thing that surprised you the most about President Trump? Honestly, so much. Um, I, I based a lot of what I originally thought of him on what the mainstream media told me, and that was before the election, before I had ever met him. And 
And, you know, the mainstream media obviously does not portray him in a positive light. And so I was not the biggest fan of, of Donald Trump before I got to know him. And when I got to know him, you know, he is so different than what you see on television. He, he's different, but he's the same. He, he's so kind and compassionate and, and honestly really down to earth. But he also is the same in the sense that he is tireless and relentless in his fight for the American people. Um, but one of the things I think really surprised me was, was how he makes decisions. And I think a lot of people think that he might be erratic or spontaneous or just does something in a tweet, but he, he really takes time and, and brings in people to, to give him opinions on all different topics. And he's, he's very uh, methodical in his decision-making, which I found really fascinating. Hey, you know, it reminds me, the way that he's portrayed as making decisions. There was a South Park episode, and I'm not a real fan of South Park, but I mm -hmm. happened to see this one, and uh, Stanley's up in a hedge fund. He's trying to get a refund on a margarita maker that has been securitized, and he sees the way they're making decisions where they cut off the head of a chicken, and then the, uh, the headless chicken marches around a wheel, and wherever the chicken stops, that's the decision or like using a magic eight ball, but yeah. Trump is much, President Trump is much more methodical than that. Yes, yes, absolutely. That's definitely what I found. Um, and I, I'm not a policy person. I was always kind of a fly on the wall for, for these decisions um, being made, but it's, it's, it's easy to, to sense that he is very, very careful and methodical in his decision-making. And I think the American people uh, should feel comfortable with him sitting in the Oval Office. So you personally, uh, was this part of your game plan to wind up in the uh, halls of power in uh, Washington, D.C.? No, not at all. Um, you know, I was a political science major in college, and so I moved to D.C. right after college and worked on the Hill while I, I had an internship on the Hill while I was looking for a job and found a job at the Republican National Committee. And I think like a lot of young politicos, you know, sure, the dream is to work in the White House, but that doesn't really come true for everybody or really for that many people at all. And so when, when Mr. Trump won the election and I had the opportunity to join the administration, I, I was absolutely um, honored. But even then, I never even dreamed that I would be working directly for the president. And so when that opportunity came along, it was just almost, almost too hard to believe. Um, but I'm so thankful for that opportunity and, and for the fact that I got to know him so well, because I think it now gives me the platform to be able to share with people who, who might have also based their opinion of him, you know, on the mainstream media, to be able to share with people what he's really like. The human side, which uh, is quite magnanimous and quite uh, under-recorded and under-appreciated mm -hmm. by the media. So he's got lots of enemies out there. And, uh, you know, I always say you judge a person by their enemies, not by their friends. <laughs> he's got some of the best enemies you could find. What is his attitude without betraying any confidences? Because understanding that there's information, conversations you need to protect because you're a trusted, confidential uh, part of the White House staff or were. Mm -hmm. Attitude towards his enemies is he pitying his enemies? Is he enraged at them? Or is he just, that just comes with the job? I think um, there's so many layers to that, to that question. I think, you know, the mainstream media, the left, the Hollywood elite, they never wanted Donald Trump to win the election. And they honestly still haven't gotten over it. And so I think he has really taken uh, bullets from all angles from the day he announced his candidacy. Um, and as time has gone on, he has gotten more used to the fact that he will probably um, never be treated fairly. And I think that's really disappointing to him because I remember a conversation he had on election night in 2018 in the midterms when Nancy Pelosi won back the House. And he was speaking to the new speaker of the House and he said to her, Nancy, we could really get something great done. And so I know that he wants to work with the other side. He wants to have a good relationship with the media and the left and, and everybody, but he's just treated so unfairly. And I think that is disappointing to him because he knows that 
he could get something really great done if people actually just came together. Yeah, well, that would be the ideal, but everyone in Washington, just mm -hmm. like in Hollywood and in New York and in Nashville, as they say, has their own game, their own agenda. So yeah. the vitriol that, uh, that we see directed towards uh, President Trump also spills off onto his staff as well. How do you, how do you deal with that? I think that was something that was really difficult to um, kind of wrap my head around was especially, you know, being a young woman in Washington, D.C. And I had so many um, colleagues and, and peers supporting Obama or working for Obama. And, and that was just, they were praised. I mean, Obama was such a celebrity. And so then when I got the opportunity to work in the White House, I had friends kind of turn, turn their backs on me. And it was just, it was really hard to kind of understand, like, I'm working for the President of the United States. Why can't you just be supportive? Um, and, you know, I wasn't a big fan of Obama, but I still respected the presidency. And I think that that is not the same, that it does not ring true for this president. And so it's, it's really hard to live in Washington, D.C., even when Republicans have control, because we're still so um, almost demonized uh, by our peers. And it's, it's really disheartening, honestly. Yeah, it sounds like really hurtful. I, I've experienced it myself. And look, I mean, I'm not a dyed-in-the-wool Trump supporter. I'm a libertarian at heart. Mm -hmm. But I think we don't have a lot of choices. And he's the only thing standing between between West, the preservation and Western civilization and the destruction of it. So from that standpoint, he has my support fully. And you know, I know there's realities, political realities, but uh, I'll uh, just uh, judge you and really totally repudiate you because of a belief. My personal views, and I think probably agree, Madeline, is that, that you would never reject somebody outright because of a political belief or an ideology. You might not agree with it, and that's mm -hmm. fine. But to actually marginalize the person, repudiate them, you just wouldn't do it. Yeah, and I think so many people these days um, in all age groups, you know, hate Donald Trump just to hate him and don't really even know why. And I tell friends and family and people I meet all the time, I would love to have a conversation with someone who doesn't support President Trump and hear what they have to say, but they don't seem willing to have a conversation with me or people who do support the president. Um, and that's where I think we get into trouble because this is, this is what America was, was founded on. It's this difference of ideals and opinions and, and that's what makes this country so great. But when we don't even have those conversations anymore, that's when it gets, it gets dangerous. Yeah, and whatever happened to the idea of of uh, disagreeing without being disagreeable? Yeah. Like, uh, you know, my parents would slam me for uh, the things these people do. In, in any event, I don't want to get into that. But I know it's got to hurt you. As part of the team, uh, you got your dream job, and here you are being demonized by uh, by virtually everyone, all of the denizens. Okay, moving along a little bit, <laughs> the swamp, the deep state, mm. all of these things, they've been trying to undermine the president, not just from the inauguration day, but before that. Yeah. And did you personally see signs of uh, people, staff, people who the president thought he could trust undermining his efforts? Um, I saw a little bit of that, um, but I think what, surprised me and was the most frustrating for me to see was when people left um, and then all of a sudden changed their tune about the president and, and spoke out against him. And, and I, my opinion is that if you are serving this, if you are serving your president and you just don't disagree, you don't agree with what he is doing, then it is your duty to leave. And I think too many people in this administration uh, were kind of sucked up in the power and in the prestige of it all. And then 
were asked to leave and then all of a sudden were very vocal about their uh, their disagreements with this president. Their so, departures. Hey, so we have seen a lot of turnover in this administration. I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. Mm-mm. It's easy though for the press to portray it as turmoil, chaos, et cetera. But just when you're managing the president's schedule alone and there's trips involved, there's a huge logistic underpinning to the presidency. How chaotic really was the White House during all this turmoil, so-called turmoil? It, it, it really wasn't chaotic. And I think we can point back to, to the turnover um, and point to the president's leadership in business. I mean, if you're a businessman and you have people working for you that are no longer doing the job to the level that you expect them to, then you're going to ask them to leave. And so I think that more t- turnover brings in fresh, fresh ideas and, and it also makes room for people who are going to work really, really hard. Um, I would also say that I'm sure there's been just as much turnover in previous administrations, but it was never reported on. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe, uh, maybe it would be better if he did it just like he did on The Apprentice, brought in the uh, TV cameras and just fired the person in public. Yeah. If he screw him anyway, he might as well get his last lick in. <laughs> it would be interesting. <laughs> so, so looking back at your tenure there, Will you, uh, do you see, foresee a time when you're going to work for another administration, get involved uh, in an administration again, perhaps at the White House? Um, I'm still pretty young. And so I think uh, there's a lot of opportunity for, for, you know, to do new, to do different things in the future. Um, Right now, I'm, I'm not focused on, you know, getting my job back or getting back into the administration. I'm kind of focused on, on, uh, sharing people, sharing with people my my the message from my book, and um, enjoying kind of getting away from Washington D.C. Washington is is not for the faint of heart, and so I spent um, seven years working in Washington, and and I am enjoying a little bit of a break right now. <laughs> All right, so I want to ask a question. If you don't want to answer, it's okay. Understandable. Uh, okay. What was the reason for you leaving? Absolutely. I I talk about that very openly in my book, Off the Record. Uh, It's my dream job at the White House, how I lost it and what I learned. And so um, I was enjoying a a rare day off and was sitting by the pool having some drinks and ended up accepting an invitation to an off the record dinner with four reporters and a White House colleague of mine. And at that dinner, I said some things that I didn't mean and that I shouldn't have said. And the reporters somehow shared that information with people and it got back to the chief of staff and president and I was asked to resign, uh, which I did and um, was able to speak to the president after that and uh, apologize to him and and he forgave me. And so I still consider uh, myself to have a a good relationship with the president, but ultimately um, I messed up and I take responsibility for that. Hey, and that's so nice to hear somebody in Washington actually taking responsibility (laughs) for their words and their actions. Yeah, it doesn't happen too often. (laughs) And uh, I assume from that incident, you've grown as a person? Absolutely. Um, I, well, I mean, I learned a lot, but I I think one of the main things I learned was that people make mistakes and there's going to be bumps along the road and it's all about kind of how you handle it and um, how you grow from it. Um, But I also was able to to get out and kind of reflect on my time in Washington and, and reflect on how I treated people. You know, I was very, very close to a lot of power and, and that gets to you. And so uh, it's been nice to, to step away from that. Okay. Well, you know, like you say, everyone does make mistakes. Once, uh, once the words are out of your mouth, it's the uh, toothpaste is out of the tube. You can't take it back. Yeah. And, and all you can do at that point is own it because you can't control the, uh, you know, you can't control the consequences of what you say. Mm-hmm. You can control what you say. And yep. it sounds like you've uh, figured that one out. And that's a big lesson there for sure. And hey, so prognostication, I just want to let you know up front that I predicted that, uh, that President Trump would be victorious in 
July of 2015 when I saw him at Freedom Fest in Las Vegas handle a crowd that really wasn't his natural constituency. Saw him put down a couple of hecklers with uh, barely a flick of his pinky. <laughs> and, uh, and then I said the day of election day, once he was uh, the next day, that he would be reelected in 2020. What's your thoughts? Um, you know, I, it's, it's 2020 has been a tough year for this country. And so I don't think this election is going to be easy. I think uh, if you had asked me that a year ago, I would have said, hands down, he's going to get reelected. No questions asked. I still believe he'll get reelected. Um, but the American people are, are suffering right now. And so they have a, a, a choice to make. And we can either continue with this optimistic America first agenda, or we can uh, go with Joe Biden's agenda, which is uh, I'm not really even sure what he stands for other than the fact that he hates this president. So um, I believe the president will win, uh, but it's going to be a tough election. Yeah, well, that makes two of you because Joe Biden doesn't know what he stands for anymore either. Yeah, if he, if I know. he ever did, if he ever did. And uh, I've always felt that he was going to be replaced the last minute. Yeah. Theory, and I'm still thinking this guy can't run for president. This is like uh, he needs to be at Happy Acres, uh, enjoying <laughs> the final resting place here. The guy has no business being anywhere, you know, 10 miles of the White House. And yet uh, his handlers, his binders, they've, uh, they've managed to pull off this thing uh, a weekend at Bernie's. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, the fact that he chose Kamala Harris um, is, was a really interesting choice because we have to think about a President Harris. And obviously she couldn't really rally her own party during the primaries. So I'm not quite sure how she's going to do that uh, again, but we'll see if, uh, you know, people underestimated President Trump back in 2016, and, and uh, I'm, I'm sure they're going to do it again, but he is someone who cannot be underestimated. Yep, yep, could not agree with you more. Well, we're speaking with Madeline Westerhout, author of Off the Record, My Dream Job at the White House, How I Lost It and What I Learned, and sounds like she's learned an enormous amount. Uh, can't wait to dig into the book and find out more. I guess we can get it at Amazon and wherever fine books used to be sold. Yes, that's right. And I also did um, my own audio book. So oh. for anyone who, who likes an audio book, uh, uh, you can check getting, that out as well. I'm going over to Audible and I'm getting it right now because I want to I want to hear your view on things and get your side of the story. Hey, Madeline, wish you the best of luck on the book. Any questions, comments for Madeline, you can email us, kl at kerrylutz.com, kl at kerrylutz.com, Twitter feed at Kerry Lutz, Facebook page is Financial Survival Network. Madeline, best of, look on the, best of luck on the book. And uh, hey, hopefully we'll talk to you on your next one. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Carrie. I appreciate it. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.